This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Join us each week for Everyday Tech on MPB Think Radio. We have an IT expert, a computer repair ace, and we troubleshoot your problems on the phones as well. Everyday Tech, Wednesdays at 10 on MPB Think Radio. Download the podcast now or listen on YouTube on the MPB Think Radio channel. Good morning and Happy New Year. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center, and this is Relatively Speaking. I hope you all have had a great beginning to 2023, but if it hasn't happened yet, today I'm going to give you a reason to look forward to this new year. I think I have some really good news for every single person who's listening to this show. You... Every one of you can improve your brain. You don't need any money. You just need to decide to dedicate some time and have a bit of determination. And today, I'm gonna work hard to convince all of you that learning new things will not only boost your mood, but improve your memory, protect your brain from aging, and honestly, it can really even help with loneliness. As I always like to do, I'll go over the science behind this first and the why I want all of us in this new year to decide why we need to learn something new. It doesn't matter how old you are. So my question is, what's going to stop you? If it's fear of failure, that should not, because even the work toward a skill, whether you master it or not, that doesn't matter. It still helps make changes. Um, Lack of support, you really don't need it. All you have to do is have you, right? Okay, so we'll, we'll talk through this as we move along. Just working to learn a new skill is good for you. All right? Well, first of all, I want to say good morning to all of you and good morning to Jay White, our producer. Um, Jay, you making it today? I am. Good morning. Good How are morning. you? Good morning. I am great. And, um, you know, as always, there are, are life changes going on and, and uh, things in our lives that are not perfect. But I guess what we have to realize is life's just not perfect, right? And so what we need to do is, is go toward trying to make things maybe a little bit better as we're moving along, right? Okay, so questions to you listeners. Have you learned something new and found that it, it changed or enhanced your life in any way at all? If it changed you, I want to hear about it. If you feel like it enhanced your life in any way, I think we need to hear about it so we can work toward convincing others. Have you noticed that your mood changed or that it allowed you to feel maybe a little bit more confident as you developed another skill? Did you find that your memory improved? All right. There are truly scientific reasons behind why all of this happens. So, so I, I want to hear your stories, listeners. I really do. I always feel like you enhance our show. So um, feel free anytime during this to give us a call about that new skill or why you tried it or what you did or maybe, maybe that brick wall that you hit. I'd love to hear about all of that. You can send an email. To family at mpbonline.org. So, all right, well, maybe like I always like to do, and I hope you enjoy it, let's start going over how we learn to do things and how we get better at it. And I'll talk to you about a little of the neuroscience. You know, we always talk about the happy part of our brain, but I'm going to talk about more than that today. We'll talk about the front part of our brain that helps us process. We'll pa- talk about the, the midbrain that helps us um, imprint memories. And so, and then how those changes happen. So, you know, I think everybody knows practice makes perfect, right? If you practice things over and over and over again, typically you're going to get better at it. But it doesn't just mean that things get easier. It actually 
that practice, doing things over and over again, really does change your brain. Okay, so how that process happens has been something that for a long time we really didn't know until some fairly recent research started being able to really look intimately into the brain and see functionally what's really happening. So a few years ago, um, scientists thought that, you know, your brain developed and then you were a teenager and then your brain development stopped. Well, you've heard me say over and over again that, that the brain is not fully developed in teenage years, and really not even until the mid-20s. Um, and so what that means is even after that, it doesn't mean that the brain stops changing, okay? It can change for the better. It can change for the worse, okay? So, so we've had some, some recent research that has come about that, that has told us that the brain is fairly plastic. It's got plasticity. That means that we still can make changes even as we are growing older. And listen, you old people like me out there, you can still make changes. And so I don't want anybody out there saying they're too old because you're not. You truly are not. We can rewire our brain. So, so let's kind of start at the beginning for a minute. The brain, you know, I think everybody thinks about the brain as being this big gelatinous blob in, in our head, right, in our skull. Well, it's, it's not just a big blob. It has all kinds of, of grooves and pathways and cells that are working. Now, even well before a child is born, the, the brain is beginning to refine, it, refine itself. Cells grow, they form new connections. You've heard me say that in, in early child development, we know that, that over a million synapses, connections, brain ca connections are happening a second, okay? And so one thing that we know is that it's important to keep pathways working to be able to keep the brain working. And so um, now we know through the use of functional magnetic resonance imaging or functional MRI that, that we, can, we can see where the brain's working when we're doing certain tasks. We've talked about neurotransmitters, right? Dopamine, serotonin, other neurotransmitters that help make connections in our brain. But, but what, what has happened is that researchers have teamed up looking at individuals as they are learning things and as people are paying attention to learning tasks. And what they found is the br brain really becomes very active when you're learning a new task, okay? If you start doing things in a rote fashion, like, I mean, even if you are a writer, if you are an individual who writes very regularly, then it, it typically does not take a huge amount of brain power to do that. That sounds kind of silly, but it's true. Anything, the same thing for, say, a soccer player or a football player. Many times those tasks become almost rote. So at the beginning of learning a new task, it takes a lot of focused attention a lot of brain power. And as you are doing that, what's happening is your brain is working a little bit harder, okay? And so stopping to think about a task as you're moving along can interfere with a maybe flawless performance. Um, so that's why you need to get into that rote to be perfect. Um, that, and that's why practice, practice, practice eventually gets you to be able to do something. 
um, with ease, okay? But, but the learning process as you're moving along is what is really good for your brain. As you're laying down new pathways, as you're teaching different areas of your brain um, to, do, to do that work, okay? So what you're doing is you're making your brain cells kind of talk to each other. And the more they talk to each other, the more they connect and those pathways um, join in, okay? So the cells send a message and they receive information about this new lesson and then it lays down um, pathways, okay? Let's take a couple of calls. I realized you don't have a list of calls in front of you, and that's why you weren't going to the calls. So let's take some calls. That sounds great, Jay. All right, first, let's go to David in Horn Lake. Hi, David. Good morning. Thank, good morning. Thank, good morning. Thank you for taking my call. Absolutely. Uh, uh, you made a hair stand up on the back of my neck when you were talking about learning new things. Uh-oh. And, uh, well, no, no, it was a good thing. It was a good thing. I, I, I uh, not too long ago, uh, just about... Uh, uh, luck of the draw, uh, found out that my local library was giving computer classes. Uh-huh. And uh, I went to Walls Public Library, and I had uh, free computer classes for anybody to want to come. And uh, I'm trying to get in the 21st century anyway. They had free laptops, and uh, uh, I got to get uh, set me up an email account and uh, learn how to uh, uh, set up a file and, you know, do it, learn some basic computer stuff. And also the library... Also, as partnered with the universities and whatnot, where you can get college uh, graded text, I mean, uh, books. So I'm trying to uh, learn about economics now. So I'm trying to learn a few things. But the, what, the reason why I mainly called is did they ever, my, I, neurological diseases run in my family. My father had Parkinson's, my mama had Alzheimer's, and one of my sisters that was diagnosed with MS. And uh, I've tried to modify my diet. I quit smoking, I quit drinking. And I'm trying to eat uh, uh, a lot of flaxseed and um, high fiber stuff and stuff that's not processed and whatnot. And what if they, if they ever found the gene that causes Alzheimer's? Oh gosh, I think um, David, that's a that's a really great question. And I will say that it doesn't seem to be just one gene. There seems to be some individuals who are at higher risk than others and obviously I'm not an expert in in um, diseases of the aged but I will say that there are some risk factors out there that increase the the risk of Alzheimer's and and you've named some of them that in, increase that you've made changes to dietary changes are important um, making sure that you diminish alcohol intake, um, cigarette smoking, because certainly changes in circulation are caused secondary to cigarette smoking and the constriction that it can cause in your vessels. And so, and the, the disease that it causes, obviously, in oxygenation. So, um, you know what I'll do? I'll work in that information for you, and I think it is about time. We're going to be talking about young brain development in the next couple of weeks, but I think we need to tag in the fact that stress alone um, can increase the risk of Alzheimer's, and there actually is some research going on um, all across the country and looking at adverse childhood events and stressors and then stressors later in life that can increase the risk of Alzheimer's. So um, you are doing probably one of the best things you can do, David, to help protect your brain, and that is learning new skills. I mean, you're just working that brain, and that's what we have to do. So congratulations on that, and I hope you'll keep on. Now, once you've mastered computers, if you ever do, I'd love to hear that because I certainly haven't. Um, once you've mastered that, if you will, then move on to a new skill. But it's a good idea to really focus hard like you've done on one and, and really learn that before you move to another. Does that help any? 
Uh, yeah, uh, is, there, is there a test for Alzheimer's? How can my, my mother, they think they had, my mother had it for years before that she was actually diagnosed with it. And uh, how do you know for just natural age and memory stuff to whether or not it may be, you know? Mm. Yeah. So good question. And yes, there are some tests. Now, there are some memory tests that your internist may be able to do or a neurologist, an adult neurologist or a geriatrician. Our mind center at the University of Mississippi Medical Center has some some awesome physicians and psychologists there who can can do evaluations and work with you. So I would encourage you to contact your primary care provider and ask them about that, especially if you have any concerns, because I think so many times many of us hide our head in the sand when if we really approached a concern early on and did something about it, we might not be able to prevent something from happening, but we certainly may be able to delay the progression of something. And so I would encourage you, um, David, contact the, it's the Mind Center at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. And um, I think you could probably get a great deal of information. They have a website uh, that you can access. But yes, they're tests. Now, once um, there are symptoms, many times you can see it on on MRIs and other brain imaging studies. So um, I would uh, yes, if you have concerns and a strong family history, I would encourage you to go ahead and get started now. Do you mind me asking you how old you are, David? 56. Okay, you're young. You have plenty of time, but but certainly if you're starting to see any kind of memory symptoms or anything like that, um, go ahead and, and even if you're not, this is a good time to be proactive and make sure you're not missing anything, Okay. David, thanks so much for your call. I really appreciate that. Okay, I see we have another caller. We have Juanita. Um, Hi, Juanita. Thanks for calling. Where are you today? Yes, here I am in Oxford. Okay, great. There you are. Okay. Tell us what your call's about. Oh, I just wanted to say in the line of learning new things, I'm 75, and I decided that it was time to, besides my normal volunteering and whatever we all do, learn something a little bit new for my brain. So I took a course online. I'm still going to go back to it now after the holidays on sign language. And they teach it um, one-on-one, and it's uh, uh, on a Zoom call. And it was so much fun, and I really think that it it did a lot for my head and did a lot for my brain. Um, Just learning symbols for words, just learning a new language, and there's nothing that's better. I'm a language teacher. Uh-huh. It's better than trying to learn a new language. So I just wanted to share that that, 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 that that kind of thing is available, and you could do it online. It's not that expensive, and uh, you could, uh, it, it's really fun. So sign language, and it's American Sign Language. So that was really fun. I just wanted to share that that, that, that was wonderful for me. Two great, two two great skills to learn, and le- yes, yeah. learning languages is um, is wonderful for the brain. And mm-hmm. you know, there's been there's been some evidence too about um, intelligence and and linkage to languages and language usage. And so we know it's good for the brain. I, you know. Um, I am a firm believer in the the epigenetics of of what we have. So you're born with genes, but your environment and what you do with those genes really is going to tell the story of how things mm-hmm. turn out, right? Mm-hmm. And you're right. So, but you know, Juanita, when you were mentioning um, learning learning the new language and learning sign language. And all I heard a lilt to your voice. It was fun, wasn't it? It was. It was so fun. I cannot <laughs> tell you how much fun it was. And how I did it was, I asked my teacher after I got through the first, you know, symbols and colors and that kind of stuff, if it would be okay if I would just prepare like a little story or a poem or something in sign language, something short, send her the copy of it by email, and then do it for her, and she would correct me. She would uh-huh. watch me do it and then take notes 
and correct what I had wrong or what I was not doing correctly. And oh, I, it was just so, it was just fun and it was soul filling. It was just a wonderful, nice thing to do in my own house during the COVID. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And you just pointed, did it cost you anything? The first little while you can go for free for uh-huh. you to, to, to try it out. And then after that, it was, um, uh, I think it came down to like $10 a class and you mm-hmm. could make your own schedule. They always send you ahead of time. And, you know, you could um, you just, um, if you couldn't make it, you didn't have to and you could reschedule. They were very flexible. Yeah, um, can I mention the name of it? Absolutely. Go ahead. It was. It's called Take a Lesson. Oh, I like it. Okay. It's a, take... Yeah, it's a website, it, and, uh, it's, and it's. I think it's for many other things besides languages, but I did find sign language, which is what I was interested in at the time. But that's the name of the, of the company, and they do everything online, and it's one-on-one. And I thought it was really very worthwhile for me. Well, it sounds like it definitely was because yeah, it, yeah. it gave you some fun in your own home. And that's that's one thing I, I as as I was looking, I know often, you know, we've got the flu going around. We've got COVID. Yeah. Everybody is yeah. feeling a little bit isolated. And to be able yeah. to do something that gives you joy in your own yeah. home and yeah. and still gives you interaction. Right. So, sure. and it gives you something to to shoot for, and something to that you feel that when you sit down to do it, you feel like your brain is working. You feel like your brain is like creating more wrinkles in your gray matter, so to speak. Well, it it actually is. It's creating <laughs> more pathways. So, <laughs> not that I need any more wrinkles, but there well, you go. <laughs> in the brain, those folds are good. Those are good. We don't want there it smooth. Go. Okay. Right, right, exactly. Well, thank you, thank you, Dr. Butchers. I enjoy it. Enjoy thank you so much for All calling right. in. Okay, we'll talk a little bit more about learning those new, new skills and and how those pathways are hardened. So I'd love to hear more, though, from others who have learned new skills, who've done something that brought joy to their lives, and, and, and perhaps maybe added a, a new uh, something there that they never thought they might have. This is Relatively Speaking. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress. Let me let me talk to you a little bit about why all of this is so so very important in in what's going on in your brain. Um, but while I'm talking, I'd love for you to think about what's going on, what you've done. Um, go ahead and share your new skill or what you'd like to do. Maybe your thought about it. Okay. So let me tell you, you, you've heard about neurons a lot. We talk about those nerve cells that connect. And I think everybody knows about those neurons in the brain. But by far, they are not the only ones. Um, another type of cell is called the glia or glial cell. That actually is 85% of all of our brain cells. And... Let me tell you what they do, and that's why learning learning a new skill and really practicing it is so important. Glia take their name from the Greek word glue, okay? So, and what glial cells do is they actually wrap around those nerve connections, okay? So you go from a neuron um, connected by an axion to another neuron, okay? And so you have glial cells that wrap around and just sort of form the glue. And that wrapping is called myelin. And that myelin sheath is what reinforces the pathway and holds the pathway together, okay? It takes care of those connections. And so the more you practice, the better the connection is and the harder and the firmer the pathway is, okay? So it doesn't have to be perfect practice. It can just, and it doesn't have to be for a long time, but as long as you reinforce that skill. So, for example, our first caller learned his new skill on the computer. So sitting down to the computer 10 minutes a day 
Or our second caller, Juanita, who learned sign language. Sitting down and working on that sign language for 10 to 15 minutes a day, if you do it every day, it's significantly reinforcing that myelin sheath. Those little glial cells, those glue cells are going all around and keeping that connection hard, okay? So, practice. All right. Well, we are going to go back to the phone. We have Tim now in Charleston. Hi, Tim. Thanks for calling. Hi. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Tell us about the new skill, or is it a question? Uh, it is a skill, and it was actually a few years ago. I served a six-year prison sentence, and about halfway through, it hit me that I have an unlimited amount of free time. Mm. And so because of that, I took two correspondence classes through Stratford University, and I took uh, paralegal studies, and I took creative writing. Wow. And so I, uh, I earned a certificate through Stratford for paralegal studies, and I was actually released in the middle of creative writing. So I, you know, once I got home, I didn't have that free time anymore, and I actually haven't finished the creative writing course, but it is a do-at-your-own-pace, so I could finish it at any time. Yeah. Wow, Tim, that is wonderful. I, I just want to tell you how that tells me what kind of person you are, that you decided to do something with that time instead of being being angry or resentful that you were in prison for whatever you. I don't I don't even need to know that. But <laughs> but but to do something that would improve yourself while you were doing that. Now, you said something, yeah. though. Um, you said something, though. I know you're, you're out and, and trying to stabilize your life and all of that, but you said you don't have time anymore. Um, no, not really. Do you think you really don't, or do you think that you are just not making time for that? I would encourage uh, honestly, you. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. I honestly don't. Uh, I, I have two small children and found out this morning that I have a third on the way. I oh, have wow. a full-time 50-plus hour a week job. Uh, so, I honestly, I just don't have enough time to do pretty much anything anymore. Oh, oh it does sound like you're really busy, but congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> On that new little being coming into this world, and and let me make a suggestion, perhaps. Yes, um, on on that, with that that knee, you've got two little ones at home, and you've got a a, a third on the way. Um, reading to those children, and and perhaps even writing them a little short story while you're spending whatever little time you have with them would be so very important. So think about, I mean, you could even creatively write a, a children's, a little short children's story for your, your babies. So, yes, so don't lose that. Don't lose that start because it sounds like you got excited about learning new stuff. And so make yourself, rather than... Um, I know, I know. If you're working 50 hours a week and then have little ones there, sometimes it does feel like you don't have time for anything. But try to carve out 10 or 15 minutes to, to read to them, to perhaps write a little something short. It, it'd be worth your while, I promise. And I think it would, would probably boost your mood to find that you're getting a little bit of time to do that. It's okay. It's really okay to take 15 or 20 or even 30 minutes to do something that gives you joy. Okay? All right. I will do that. All right. Hold, me, hold yourself to that, and I hope you'll call back and let us know if you did it. Okay? All right. I will. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Tim, for calling. Well, let's stay on the phones. We have Sue in Beaumont. Hi, Sue. Can you hear me? Yes, we're hearing you well. And you always have such good thoughts, so let's hear it. Well, thank you. Years ago, uh, I was writing for the newspaper, and there was a, right about that time there was a lot of discussion about football players and concussions and how some of the retired football players, the older men, uh, you know, were really having really severe problems with, with uh, mental disorders due to concussions. 
I, now I'm wondering, you never hear anything about that anymore. I know they've taken precautions mm -hmm. uh, for younger players now, to, well, all football players, to be as protected as possible against a concussion. But why don't you ever hear anything about that anymore? Or is there what's, what's progress on that? Oh, gosh. Um, actually, there was something just recent. Um, a football player was just recently hospitalized after a fairly looking like minor hit. And they're not sure if it was a cardiac event or not. But there, there actually so there has continued to be a fair amount of talk on how much protection players need. Um, not, not just in football, but in other areas, but certainly football, where the object of the game is to hit each other. And so um, that's still a big, big concern. And um, a lot of research has gone on with that. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and this is maybe a bit tangential, but, but sort of the same, because when you're trying to recover, from a brain injury, many times you do have to, just like with a stroke, you do have to maybe set new pathways to take over an old pathway of the brain that was damaged. But again, research has shown that you can do that. You can do that. Now, repeated head trauma to the brain is terrible. And, and we know that that does, um, speaking of the man who called earlier um, to, to David, I believe, um, is that that does increase the risk of dementia and Alzheimer's is repeated brain trauma and repeated stress. So so, why, would people let their, why do people let their little, little kids start playing football then? I mean, it seems as if you would protect them as long as their brains are still information, you know, I, 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 an occasion occurred where <clears throat> a young football player was uh, knocked unconscious and his coach went and told him as soon as he woke up, as soon as they got him alert again, he get back out on the field. Yeah. <laughs> ridiculous you know yeah well and now that would be illegal and he would be he he would be held responsible if something happened to that child so there are laws there are rules and regs out there and i do think the the football industry has has really begun to work hard to try to make improvements there um you know, you ask the question, why do parents let their children play football? Um, you know, I know uh, Jay White, who has been very involved in sports over the years, um, may have a comment to that as we move along. Um, but I do think that, you know, if your child feels real passionate about it and you feel like that there are good rules put up and there are helmets that are made to protect, perhaps you think you're allowing your child to do something that they have passion about. Um, you know, uh, again, um, uh, Jay, I don't know if you have a comment about um, why parents let their kids play football, but we are taking a little bit of a turn, but go ahead. Well, I, I don't know. It's, it's, that's a good question, uh, especially, you know, there's been some injuries this year that make me wonder if, and I, it's not the first time I've wondered this, but you wonder if, right. if uh, technology, uh, like performance technology has passed the responsive ability of the human body sometimes. Yeah. I yeah. don't know, uh, from a performance standpoint in athletics. Uh, so from... Um, from somebody's perspective of why send their kids out to do that, I do understand it. But at the same time, you know, I, I think maybe parents say you know, every time you put your kid in a car, there's, yeah. you know, you're taking a chance with them. And so I can understand it from that perspective, too. So I, I don't I don't judge anybody from either side of that. Yeah. So I will tell you, as a parent, I discouraged my boys from playing football, but I encouraged them to play other sports because I do. There is clear evidence that team sports um, or team activities, whether it's Boy Scout or dance team, or whatever, um, that swim team, that that all of that is good for a child. It teaches them how to work with others. It teaches them to work toward the good of the whole and not just for themselves. And so, 
you know, that's an, that could be another whole radio show, Sue. It was always, so uh, you always come up with ideas that we could take and run with. But, um, yeah, um, we know team sports are good. We know that we've got to do a better job of protecting our children's brains. And, you know, again, I am, I am all about making sure that we do whatever we can do to protect their brains from from anxiety, from trauma, from from anything that impairs the the well-being of a child. So thanks, Sue. Thanks for your call, as always. Um, well, we will stay on the phone. We have another fairly frequent caller, Brother Daniel. Hey, Brother Daniel. Happy New Year, Mama. Happy New Year to you. Yeah. Yeah. And Happy New Year, Mississippi. I love you. I, I hope that peace and love can conquer everything that has happened in life in the past. I feel uh, Mississippi is about to be the, the place to be. But uh, I watched the game yesterday, and what happened when he tackled the guy from the front, you know, they already say you got to be careful. I played football for about seven years of my life. You have to be careful when you come down hard, you, 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 you know, you, his helmet is pressing against his chest. Mm. So, Bob, when he came down, his heart must have changed. You know how your heart beat changed, and it must have caught it in a certain way. So I, I believe that's how that cardiac arrest happened. Mm-hmm. Because I've been in a situation when I tackled somebody, and I came down hard, and he came down on top of me. Mm-hmm. You know, just like he was doing wrestling. You know, I couldn't breathe for a minute, you mm-hmm. know? So, you know, you, you have to be very careful. You have to prepare your children to know how to, when you play, you have to be careful how you play. So you can get hurt dancing, you can get a broken leg. A uh, uh, Buffalo Sabre guy got hit in the chest with a, uh, you know, the skate a long while back. And I don't know if it paralyzed or if he died. But you have to be careful in everything you do in the day. That's why be cautious of your children, uh, be cautious of your teenagers, be cautious as an adult, and know that when you do something, be careful how you do it. Don't get so caught up in the excitement, which he did, and, and not prepare yourself for what, what, you, what you're playing, you know? Yeah. Because yeah. It, it can happen. Yeah. But I just want to wish you a happy new year. And well, we made it through <laughs> all the COVID and everything. Amen. Amen. So far, right? So we are going to just make this new year a good one for everybody. And we're going to work on learning those new skills. So everybody improves that brain as we move along. Okay. We're going to get to Cliff, who is waiting in Brandon, to talk more about... Um, what we're learning, new skills, how to do it, how to imprint them, how to make the best of what we were given, right? Okay, this is Relatively Speaking. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress. Well, let's go on back to the phones. We have Cliff and Brandon. Hi, Cliff. Hey, Dr. Buttress. How are you doing? Doing great. Thank you. Well, uh, back during COVID in 2020, I was needing something to do. I'm retired, and I uh, found out about a, a language uh, lesson deal that you can do, which is called. I'll, since you, I heard you mention it earlier, that it's okay to give the name. Sure. So it, it's Duolingo, D U O L I N G O. Uh huh. And they teach something like 25 different languages. And I uh, did Spanish because I'd had it in high school and forgotten most of it. But what they do is they. Uh, start you off with four pictures, you know, like a school and an apple and two other things. Uh-huh. They got the Spanish word under it, you know, so they ask which one is the apple, and so you touch it, you know, and the name of it is a manzana, and so it, that's good, you get that right. You know, it's real simple that way. It starts you off easy, and it just proceeds and grows from that. So tell me, when you were doing this, are you still are you still doing it? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I, are you finding that it's fun? Are you enjoying it? 
Oh, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. I couldn't believe I could do it. You know, <laughs> uh, they uh, not only uh, you know uh, have it in print for you to look at and respond to. They also will say the sentence that they're uh, you know wanting you to uh, do something with, and sometimes you repeat that sentence to them, and if you get it right, fine. If you don't, they ask you to try it again. And then sometimes they um, have a question and you need to fill in the blank. And then sometimes they want you to give the whole sentence in Spanish, you know, mm -hmm. from scratch. Mm -hmm. And that's the hardest thing. But uh, sometimes they have a word bank where you can tap the various words and figure it out. Yeah. You know, so it makes it a lot of fun. I, I know I've learned at least a thousand words. And that's great. Confused. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know what you should do? You should reach out and um, see if there's somebody in your area who you could now start practicing that with in a conversational sense. I'm sure that there is someone out there around you who's very proficient because um, once, you, once you start learning as much as you have, this would be a great time to practice it. But... Um, have you, I just want to ask, Cliff, I, I know you said during 2020, I guess, you know, COVID yeah. is still here. We keep saying during COVID back then, it's still here, unfortunately. But, um, right. you know, in the, in the height of our isolation, I think many people were feeling lonely. Um, did you find that it, it helped you in that area besides making it fun for you to learn? Did you find that you were less lonely or feeling alone? Oh, yeah. Um, it gives you something to do. It occupies your time, and you feel good about it. You've learned something. It's fun. So, yes. Well, that um, a, yet another really good suggestion. I think it's interesting that um, out of our out of out of our callers who talked about new skill sets, uh, two were in the area of language: one sign language and and one um, an, another, so Spanish. So that that is a, an area that's really good for you. But I want to remind everybody that it doesn't have to be. A language. It could be art. It could be a musical instrument. Instrument. It could be like one of our callers said, creative writing, or even if you want to learn about paralegal stuff. I mean, I think it's so interesting to hear um, what sort of grabs people when they think, "Okay, I need something to do." Now, it does fill space. And it does help with loneliness, but to me, probably the best of all of that is that it, it also is enhancing your brain as you're moving along. Cliff, like I had told Juanita, that those learning language skills is, is one of the best things you can do for your, for your brain. But exercise... Um, Musical instruments, creative writing, drawing, all of those are very, very good. Um, so, Cliff, thanks for that call. Um, and, again, never, never too old. Cliff, before you hang up, how old are you? 78. Okay. I am loving this. People, I, we haven't gotten a young caller. I'd love to hear a young caller call in and tell us what new skill they learned. But I am so loving hearing people who are in, in the senior arena um, getting excited about still learning. You know, I had a fa father-in-law um, who, who was an amazing um, man. He was a carpenter by hobby. Um, and career military by by trade, my my first father in law, and he he loved to learn. He would pull out a, a atlas and read about things. He would pull out a National Geographic and read it from beginning to end. That love of learning was always there. And he lived way past 90. And I think some of that was because of that. So, 
Anyway, okay, in the next few minutes, let me, a couple of minutes, let me just talk to you about that learning uh, and a couple of things I haven't covered yet. One, it's really important as you're learning a new skill to spread it out. Don't feel like you have to do it all at once because your learning is imprinted better by periodic learning like that. So spread it out over many days, a little bit at a time. And the way the way that works better, this really does, again, there's science behind it. It allows the links between the neurons to strengthen. Remember those glue cells, those glial cells I was telling you about? It allows them to lay down a denser, heavier pathway. Um, it also helps to imprint those memories. Every time you sleep, you imprint memories of what you learned in that day, okay? If you have good sleep, we talk about that all the time, how important sleep is. So that hippocampus gets to store those memories, okay? So if you store those memories over and over again, you're going to be a lot better off than trying to cram it all at once. It's just like teaching a teenager how important it is to learn, or, or any kind of student, to learn a little bit at a time instead of cramming for an exam just to give it 30 minutes a day instead of eight hours the day before the, an exam. You'll, you'll imprint it and you'll really have it there. Okay. Well, you guys, this was fun. Thank you so much for sharing your stories. And if you'd like to hear this show again or any other past episode, I hope you'll listen to the podcast on your favorite podcast app by searching Southern Remedy Relatively Speaking. This show is a production of MPB Think Radio and engineered by Jay White. My call screener was Charles Arnold. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, and I hope you'll join us next Tuesday at 11 for Relatively Speaking and that you'll stay tuned for NPR's Here and Now coming up next right here on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.